brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals. These are gloomy times and it's a gloomy day, but life must go on. The living must continue to live and some way has to be found to keep guns out of the hands of these people who intend to use them to slaughter others, to deal with the National Rifle Association, whose aim is to influence as many political bodies as possible, from the president on down to school boards even. But instead of going into all of that, I have some articles that I'm going to read. Down through the years, in and out of the legislature, I've spoken against the proliferation and the ready availability of guns. The way they show up in our community, in the hands of people in their lower teens. I've mentioned this before. A few years ago, I was in a barber shop and there were some youngsters, maybe ranging from 14 to 16. And I said, do you know where I could get a gun? And one of them said, Senator, I can get you a gun easier than I can get you a candy bar from right here where I am. So when kids can say that, just matter of factly, then you see the shootings involving young people, you know that there is a ready availability of guns in our community and they are directed against us. People commit crimes against those around whom they live. Black people engage in harming black people more than they will anybody else. In the Jewish community, it's the same, Italian committee, people commit crimes against those around whom they live and sometimes their own family. So that is not the issue that I'm going to deal with, just touching on it. I'm going to read some articles. Down through the years, I had written columns for the Omaha Star and I had talked incessantly about the ready availability of guns and how they needed to be dried up in our community. But rather than speak off the cuff, none of which I have today, I'm gonna to read some of these articles and the dates of them. This one is from February 4th, 2011. It was in the Omaha Star, titled National American Pastime, Shooting People. Now, because I'm reading these, the print, and they're old, the print is not always clear. If I stumble over my words, it's not that I can't read. It's not that I'm getting emotional. It's just that my eyes, which are aging, are failing me. Out in Arizona, where they hate, quote, illegals, meaning Hispanics, Jared Lee Loeffner killed six people and wounded 14 with a semi-automatic pistol tricked out with an extra capacity magazine. Neither killing nor using a gun is unusual in America. Gun killings occur everywhere, from the chaotic metro metropolis to the sleepy bucolic hamlet. And guns are as ubiquitous, that means everywhere, as dandelions in yards and fields in the summertime. Utah is even musing about enshrining the semi-automatic pistol as its state emblem. That's appropriate in view of the fact that the Mormon religion is headquartered out there, their religious trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost provides imagery that carries over into the realm of the gun whose trinity comprises Colt, Smith, and Wesson. Such happy symmetry. Considering the killing, that killing and guns are so commonplace in the U.S. as American as apple pie, one may ask, so what's with the hubbub over JL indulging in the national pastime? It's not that he killed or used a gun, it's whom he killed and wounded that captures the spotlight, transfixes public attention and incites national outrage along with the standard and predictable shouting and sprouting of makeshift memorials, public displays of sorrow and mourning and pious pleas for prayer, prayers, et cetera. And you've all heard the statement from politicians on down, we have you in our prayers. Apparently those prayers are falling on deaf ears or they're going to the wrong source. So they need to stop praying 
and start doing something that has some value in this world. All lives are not created equal. In America, the lives of some are valued more than others. JL killed a federal judge and severely wounded a US Congresswoman. Such important people cannot be enshrouded in a cloak of virtual anonymity like that draped over the shoulders of ordinary, common, or gar garden variety people who routinely are hustled violently from life or into a hospital by hot lead spewed from the smoking mouth of the gun in the hands of a mass murderer. Can you name the other five people slain or even the judge? Frequent updates on the condition of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords keep her name out there. Why this difference of valuation? Public officials are a cut or two above run of the mill folks and an attack upon them is regarded by them and their kind as an attack upon what is sacred and essential to the well being and even the survival of the nation itself. Such an attack upon one of their own sends seismic tremors of terror through the ranks of those more important classes who so often don't give a finger snap for the common people and the violent calamities that rip and tear at them and the fabric of their lives every day and every night. But isn't that always how it goes? When the wolf is at somebody else's door, it's whole hum time. However, when that ravening beast takes up residency on their doorstep, all are expected to stop the music, drop everything and come running to their rescue. Can you honestly, in your most visualistic imagining, envision the president, members of Congress and federal judges showering attention and concern on ordinary victims of a mass shooting. They're doing it a little more now because it's getting closer to home. Generally, Lincoln's words in his Gettysburg Address are more apt. Those big shots will little know nor long remember what happens to ordinary people who are deemed so unlike themselves in terms of basic human dignity and intrinsic worth. At this moment, Jared Lee Loeffner, with his chilling, eerie smirk, is commanding center stage, along with his unfortunate co-star, Congresswoman Gifford. Why? Because his is an easy story with legs of its own. It will carry it a ways farther in the media, in the media arena. But as says the song about poor little lambs, he'll pass and be forgotten like the rest. I'm sure people have forgotten this guy that I'm reading about now. The rest of whom? The rest of the mass shooters. Without resort to the internet, who can recite the names of the West Virginia, the Fort Hood, and the Omaha Bon Mar shooters, or any other of the myriad partakers in the national pastime of mass mayhem? Many people don't know how to pronounce J.L.'s last name if they see it in print, and most who hear it pronounced don't know how to spell it. He's merely the latest 15-minute fad of the day mass killer. He's the antagonist in this American tragedy, while Congresswoman Giffords is the protagonist. Before too much time has elapsed, both will share the fate of the seven crew members who perished when the Challenger space shuttle exploded 25 years ago, their names will gradually fade and ultimately be erased from the active memory of the public. Guns and mass murder. The National Rifle Association or the NRA. Gun lovers and those who garner money from guns are fond of intoning, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Maybe so. But indisputably, people who do mass killings always use guns. For knives, sticks, or bricks simply won't work. On the other hand, serial killers who fashion their string of victims one at a time, craving that up-close and personal contact, use everything, 
from hammers to bare hands, and they prefer working in secret and secluded venues, unlike mass shooters who are open and bodacious and care not who or how many may witness their carnage. One of them recently stormed a Detroit police precinct wielding a pistol grip shotgun and had those terrified cops skedaddling and diving for cover before he was shot dead after wounding four of the scurrying heroes. Now, if he had come with only a knife or a club instead of a gun, mass killers prefer a high efficiency gun that can kill a lot quickly, as was the case with JL, whose extra capacity magazine enabled him to kill a lot quickly. Six dead and 14 wounded. A stunning few seconds work for a thing that doesn't kill people without a gun. Where the person may be a coward or mentally, emotionally disturbed, if a gun finds its way into his hands, a gun that whispers seductively, inducing him to act on his inner feeling, voila, a mass murderer. Absent ready access to a gun, the disturbed person may vent in various ways, but mass murder, no way. For gunless equals mass murderless. Take it for what it's worth. Now I said in my headline in 2011, National American Pastime Shooting People. This is from the newspaper Wednesday, April 6th of this month, of this year, just last month. Mass shootings are becoming white noise. Maybe I was a little ahead of the curve on this as other things. Experts say cases often fade into the background. I wrote my column in 2011. 11 plus 11 equals 22. I wrote mine 11 years ago. And this printing is even smaller, so I'm going to have to bring it closer. I adapt it to my circumstances and my environment. Sacramento, California. 11 people were wounded and one killed after a concert in Dallas. Five more people were hurt when they were shot on a rural road in South Carolina. Sunday's horrific melee in Sacramento was just one of three mass shootings in the United States over the weekend. Evidence some experts believe that extreme cases of gun violence are becoming so routine that they almost fade into the background. Quote, we only hear about some of these shootings, unquote, said James Densley, a criminal justice professor in Minnesota who runs a mass shooting database called the Violence Project. Quote, it kind of breaks my heart to have to say that, unquote. The worst mass shooting in Sacramento history. How many people who are listening to me had it in the forefront of their recollection, a mass shooting in Sacramento? This article is from just last month. The worst mass shooting in Sacramento history left six people dead and 12 wounded generating the kind of instant ritual that almost invariably accompanies mass shootings in America. Gun control advocates, including President Joe Biden, demanded stricter laws. Gun rights advocates warned against a rush to judgment and said policymakers should focus on other contributors to violence, such as mental health or socioeconomic factors. Professor Densley said, Certain types of mass shootings tend to stick out in the public's memory longer, such as those involving children or people who clearly were targeted because of their ethnicity or religion. Think of the massacres at a black church in South Carolina in 2015, a synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, or a New Zealand mosque in 2019. Others are more likely to recede from the public's consciousness, said Densley, who teaches at Metro State University in Minnesota. Quote, 
Some of these have become white noise, particularly if it occurs in communities of color, he said. You barely hear about them anymore. Sacramento shooting involved an exchange of gunfire outside a collection of nightclubs. It appears most, if not all, were people of color. City officials were adamant that they would not regard Sunday's incident as business as usual. Quote, we can never accept it as normal, unquote. Mayor Daryl Steinberg said at a Sunday afternoon press conference at police headquarters. But he also said Sacramento needs to move on and not become paralyzed. He encouraged residents to keep coming downtown. Quote, we also have to live our lives, he said, quote, we don't want to shut down, unquote. The shooting was in a neighborhood of color. White man says life must go on. We must not shut down. It didn't bleed over into them and theirs. Some elected officials fear that it can become too easy to move on, quote, we know the daily toll from gun violence is in every community, said Mayor Sam Licardo of San Jose. It should be eliciting protests at every city hall, at every state capitol. Instead, there's this conspiracy of inaction. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, day I face the barren waste without the taste of water, cool water. I often do things for the purpose of giving an object lesson. You see, I'm the one reading this material because I take very seriously these mass killings. How then am I going to stop immediately after reading about how casually the white officials in Sacramento say we must move on. And then I myself stop, take a drink of water and in a very poor quality voice, sing about all the day I face the barren ways. It's to give an object lesson of how the most serious issue in America can be brushed aside by something trivial, something lighthearted, something designed to be funny. Sometimes object lessons are the best teacher. It bothers me when anybody dies. I don't think any human being ought to kill another human being. I don't think another human being should harm another human being. But what I think, how I feel, what I argue have no bearing, no impact on what's going to happen in the world out there. So what we are restricted and limited to doing is what we can, where we are with what we have to work with. My words may be falling on deaf ears. Maybe nobody is watching this. Maybe nobody's listening. I don't know. But John the Baptist was described in the Bible as a voice crying in the wilderness. The wilderness is uninhabited by human beings. St. Francis of Assisi used to preach to animals. There is a need in human beings to communicate with other human beings, with other sentient beings that can understand even if they are people who refuse to understand, just that very human contact is essential. But those are the kind of thoughts that don't occur to people in an environment like exists today. The internet, social media, disinformation, misinformation, divisions that are encouraged and in some cases created by politicians whose main aim in life is to stay in office. They'll say anything, they'll do anything, they'll invoke the name of God, Christ, the two rascals running for governor, 
Palin, I meant Pillin and Herbster both described themselves as men of faith, Christians. And that's when I become concerned and alarmed. The ones who used burning people alive at the stake were Christians. In the church which calls itself the only true church, the Catholic church. And when they burn somebody alive, it happened in Spanish speaking countries to a greater extent than other places, an auto de fe, an act of faith. And imagine what it means to be tied to a stake, have wood and other flammable materials stacked around you, then have that set afire. And you see the flames and you feel the fire burning you literally alive in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Think about a red hot stove and somebody mashing your hand against it and holding it and it's hissing, it's smoking. You smell the burning flesh, but you cannot escape it. This is what Christians did because of differences of opinion. The Puritans came to this country supposedly to escape religious persecution in Europe. They had this fascination and obsession about witches. There were spirits, the succubus, the incubus. The incubus was the male that would attack women at night. And these women were supposedly witches. And some of them obviously had mental problems because the descriptions of what they said in the records that exist even today was that this creature came to them in the middle of the night and had an extra long penis and they engaged in vigorous sexual activity. And the succubus was the feminine equivalent who would attack men at night. And instead of looking at these people as those who are our afflicted brothers and sisters for whom we should be keepers, not in the way that somebody in a zoo is a keeper of animals, but in the way that one human being should look after and help one, a brother, a sister, who is unfortunate and cannot help himself or herself. How would they test whether a woman is a witch? Throw her in the water and if she sinks, she's a witch. They would have this long arm of wood with a seat on the end of it and would tie her to it and duck her in the water and hold her for long periods of time. Some of them, they would drown in that fashion. Christians in the name of the father, the son and that other one. One guy described them in the day the music died. He said, and the three men I admire the most, the father, the son and the Holy Ghost caught the last tank, trained for the coast. Today, the music died. Well, going back to the recitation, if you didn't believe, quote, the way these Puritans and pilgrims believe, you were in serious trouble and you could lose your life. They supposedly came to this country to escape religious persecution. A rhyme could be pilgrims to escape religious persecution to this country came to worship in their own way and force others to do the same. And if you didn't, it was woe to you. But let me go back to this that I was reading. And that was about me leaving a very serious subject to take some water and sing an off key song. This comment, we also have to live our lives, this 
mayor said, we don't want to shut down. Some elected officials fear that it can become too easy to move on. Quote, we know the daily toll from gun violence is in every community, said Mayor Sam Licardo of San Jose. It should be eliciting protests at every city hall, at every state capitol. Instead, there's this conspiracy of inaction. Licardo knows the routine all too well. Last spring, an apparently disgruntled employee shot nine of his coworkers to death at a Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority complex in downtown San Jose. The man then killed himself. Although the property damage disrupted transit service for weeks, Licardo said he was startled at how quickly life seemed to return to normal in San Jose. Quote, I was heartened by the response of thousands of community members who contributed to help the families who went to vigils, he said. That being said, we have very short memories. San Jose, Jose did take some action afterward. In January, the city council passed an ordinance requiring gun owners to carry liability insurance. Another ordinance requires them to pay a $25 fee, which the city will donate to noteworthy and noteworthy nonprofits engaged in the programs that aim to prevent violence. Licardo said the fee is being challenged in court by gun rights groups. Sweeping legislative changes are rare. While liberal California has 107 gun control laws in effect more than any other state, experts say it can be difficult to sustain momentum for ambitious gun control on a nationwide level. Democrats have departed, despaired about their inability to revive the federal ban on assault weapons, which expired in 2004. And now that's one of the favorite weapons of choice of the mass murderers. Ben Newman, a UC Riverside political scientist who studied mass shootings, said high profile incidents bring about a flurry of political activity from ordinary citizens. Online searches for information, posts on Twitter, donation to gun control groups. But this activity sometimes turns to apathy as proposals for reform get ground up by the political process or the judicial system. When there's a shooting, quote, there's an uptick nationally of people engaging in political behavior on gun control, Newman said. But there's scant evidence that this activity translates into an increase in voter registration or turnout, he said, and politics is what politicians pay attention to. You don't register to vote, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal when you talk. You register and don't vote, you're like the voice crying in the wilderness. You're like the wind that rustles the leaves but doesn't do anything. Politicians look at who votes and how they vote. If you don't vote, don't complain. And this is not one of those sarcastic comments of mine. It is the practical comment from a practical politician who is in the legislature longer than anybody in the history of Nebraska has been or ever will be due to term limits, 46 years. I know politics, I know politicians, and I know the only thing they're interested in is staying in office. They're either kept in office or booted out of office by those who vote. You don't register, they don't care about you. You don't vote, they don't care about you. Why can you go to the city council and complain about the downtown library being kicked aside so that Mutual of Omaha can move a few blocks and take prime territory in the middle of downtown because you don't vote. The city council members don't feel accountable to you. They're accountable to the big shots. Why will they talk about building a corridor in what they call the core of the city and then connect some of that to council bluffs because that's where white people and the big shots live. It has been stated and documented that the building of the North Freeway destroyed the integrity of the black community. While it was stoppable, I and Cynthia Granberry, who worked with me and a few other people were out there, but I was walking those streets. I was knocking on doors. 
I was printing up petitions to be signed. Some people joined in that effort. We had thousands of signatures, presented them to the city council, and these white devils said, anybody can get signatures. That's how they dismiss whatever we do. The highway was going to pass within feet of some existing houses. Ben Gray had relatives near Lake Street where the North Freeway exits and then crosses. I mean, and you can turn and go down Lake or you can go across Lake and resume. Those people had property that diminished in value. Here's how white people work. They target an area for a construction or demolition project. Immediately, the value of the property goes down. When they decide to come through and take that property by eminent domain, if you're not willing to sell it, they've diminished the price of it, the value of it, so you don't get much for your property. These white people know what they're doing. They've always done it. They're doing it now. But there are some white interests who, now being, who are now being affected, like Mutual of Omaha coming to the middle of downtown and kicking aside the library. White people suddenly say, well, these big shots don't care about us. They never did. But you were in a holding action. They needed somebody to keep that property from falling into disrepair until they wanted it for their purposes. And that was you, white geniuses. And now you're feeling the shoe pinch, aren't you? And when you cry out, you want somebody to help you, don't you? When the pandemic came, you wanted money expended to help you with your expenses since you're out of work, didn't you? You wanted a longer period of unemployment assistance, didn't you? Well, what about those people you were calling moochers and spongers who were not of your complexion or who were of your complexion, but not your social economic milieu? Moochers, spongers, hangers on. And now this rich man who's rich, not because of anything he did, but because of what his daddy did. Ricketts said that money the federal government is making available to help people pay their rent, rejected it. And he said that teaches people to be dependent. It's not his money. It's not his daddy's money. And he doesn't have to worry because he never had to work, in a, day, work a day in his life. And when he was so incompetent in the business that his daddy didn't want him out there, he kicked him out and told him, run for politics, run for a political office, and I'll spend whatever money it takes to get you elected. The first time around, he was so goofy, he put a stocking cap on his ears, his ears stuck out. His mother even made fun of him and said, don't do that again. So the next time, he had some people who advised him. But still, thousands and thousands of dollars could be put into his campaign by his daddy who under no circumstances wanted him to come back to the business. What can be said about his daddy? A billionaire, the founder of TD Ameritrade. I don't know anything about stock broking, but I know about broke stockers. People who are tricked into investing in the market who don't know anything and they take a bath. They don't just lose their shirt, they lose their homes. Any money they had, if they had a pension plan, they would tap into that kind of money and they become impoverished so that the rich get richer and the poor get children. When it started affecting white people, suddenly these programs called welfare programs from the spongers, for the spongers were not called that anymore. They even changed the name from welfare department to the Department of Health and Human Services so that white people wouldn't be embarrassed when they had to get what was called welfare when it wasn't coming their way, when the wolf was not at their doorstep. But now that it's coming home to them, they even changed the name of the game. And there are a lot of white people who can't pay their rent. So, and I'm glad this is happening, legal aid and some lawyers are giving few free advice to people who are being foreclosed on or being evicted. And they're at the courthouses trying to advise people of any shreds of right that they might have left. 
So this white man, Joe Ricketts, was caught red-handed putting racist and anti-Muslim tweets or whatever you call them on the internet. There was a bakery that was donating to one of this thing. They got all these crosses out on the highway somewhere, the stages of Christ. They stopped donating. Others pulled back from him. Young Ricketts, Baldy, and the governor's chair now said he didn't know his daddy was a racist. You believe that? Then you believe that donkeys can fly. This rich man, this billionaire, decided to take advantage of these weak need people on the Omaha City Council, and he got them to give him some of this tax increment financing, TIF. That's where instead of you paying taxes like everybody else, the money that you pay into taxes is given back to you so you can pay for the loans or the financing of these big projects. You're a multi-billionaire. And he got this Omaha City Council to give him over $5 million of your tax money. He had an area where he wanted to build declared blighted and substandard around 108th and Dodge and those areas. I don't get out there, I drive through it sometime when I'm going somewhere else. They were furious and outraged. They said, how dare he say our area is blighted? Look at our homes, look at our lawns, look how we flourish. But this rich man was treating these white people like these white people treat non-white people or poor white people. You don't count. We'll let you live as long as you're not in the way. But when you get in the way, so long it's been good to know you. So he had the area declared blighted. $5 million in TIF money so that he could build his TD Ameritrade building. Then you know what that clever, venal, vicious, white, rich devil did? And it's why Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get in heaven. He sold it to Charles Schwab for guess how much? $26 billion. And to show how he's putting his rear end in you all's face, you white people think you're so smart and making you kiss it. He doesn't live in Nebraska because you have to pay income tax. He lives in a place I think is called Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or one of those places. And you know why he moved out there? You don't have to pay income tax. This billionaire who got TIF money, the money from the hardworking taxpayers, as they describe themselves in Omaha, but he lives in another place because he doesn't want to pay those taxes here, but he'll take the tax money. That's what that rich man did. So when it comes now to the mass shootings, there are these big shots with the NRA and others who don't care about ordinary people being killed, the children being slaughtered in the schools, because they have something else in mind. Tremendous amounts of money are in the gun industry. The manufacturers, the dealers, the traders, the thieves, those who make straw purchases, people who can legally buy guns and then they take them and they sell them on the street. They bring them here when they collect a lot of them one way or another in states where you don't have to have a license to have a gun, to buy a gun, to trade a gun or sell a gun. They load them up and they take them to places like Omaha, Chicago, Minneapolis. They know where the guns are going to be easily distributed. And as long as those guns are used in the poor neighborhoods, the black neighborhoods, the Latino neighborhoods, white people don't care. That's why there's such a ready availability of guns in Omaha and other black neighborhoods. But now it's bleeding over into white communities. I'm not gonna be able to say everything today that I have in mind, but I wanna to touch on a lot of them.
and I speak as they say the spirit moves me. What spirit? Not a ghost, not a goblin. And the thing about this, you can turn it off whenever you want to, and you don't have to tune in in the first place. I don't see you. I don't know who's out there. I can see this microphone. I can see the camera. But maybe nobody is watching. And if they are, how do I know? If a lot, what difference does it make? If a few, what difference does it make? Personally, I would like people to see. I'd like them to listen. And more than that, I would like them to hear. But if they do, it's as nothing to me. I neither increased or diminished based on whether people listen to me, agree with me, accept or reject what I say. The wind bloweth where it listeth. The wind is going to blow whether there are any people, any animals, or anything that can perceive it is there or not. It's going to do what it's going to do. Comets will continue to have tails. The sun will continue to shine. Moons will continue to be discovered, but they've always been there. As human beings, knowledge increases, the scope and size of the universe will increase. They sent a huge telescope into outer space so that they could peer deeper into space than ever before. And it was so large, so complex, that it was put together in this launch vehicle. And when it got to its destination in space, then it was released and it came open and the parts fit where they were supposed to and it was assembled. But guess what's happening? After being able to peer deeper into the universe than ever before, the ability to quote, see that the telescope had is diminishing because of, of all things, solar dust. Maybe they should have put one of those little rumbas or whatever they call them, those little vacuum cleaners that run around your house, got some miniature ones and put them on the telescope so that its lenses could be cleared of solar dust. But that's the way it goes. Science moves by making missteps, starts and stops but they try to the extent possible to base what they do on that which is factual or that which is real. They theorize, they look at a situation and based on the way that situation is operating, they come up with speculation. Speculation is where you pull things out of the air, put them together and come up with a notion. Then when you get enough of those things together, you go from speculating to theorizing. You say this point was established, one, two, three, four were established. And now because they're moving in this direction, the next step will probably be, but we can't say for sure, then it's taken. Then the theory becomes a movement from theorizing to hypothesizing. You get a hypothesis where you build almost an entire system, some of it based on fact that has been established, proved, and demonstrated through experimentation that it's always going to produce, produce this result when you put these things over here, one after the other. They hypothesize. Then they can't eat the whole roll. So they extrapolate. You take what is known here and you extrapolate, you move from that to something else. And then you say that it probably would be the same over there. So when they say you extrapolate from this, you're taken from this and operating over there. And I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. Not that I know that much, but I don't have a better way to explain it than what I'm doing here. But anyway, they're now acknowledging that all this shooting is white noise years after my statement that a national American pastime is shooting people. Now, 
to what has happened recently. This is from Sunday's World Herald. Gunman kills 10 in racially motivated New York shooting. Buffalo, New York. A teenage gunman wearing military gear and live streaming with a helmet camera opened fire with a rifle at a Buffalo, New York supermarket in what authorities described as racially motivated violent extremism, killing 10 people and wounding three others. Saturday before he surrendered, authorities said. Police officials said the 18 year old gunman who was white was wearing body armor and military style clothing when he pulled up and opened fire at people at a Topps friendly market. Quote, he exited the vehicle. He was very heavily armed. He had tactical gear. He had a tactical helmet on. He had a camera that he was live streaming what he was doing, City Police Commissioner Joseph Cromaglia said, Gromaglia said at a press conference afterward. Gromaglia said the gunman initially shot four people outside the store, three fatally. Inside the store, a security guard who is a required retired Buffalo police officer fired multiple shots at the gunman and struck him, but the bullet hit the gunman's bulletproof vest and had no effect. The commissioner said the gunman then killed the security guard. Can I show you all how I get laughed at, mocked and ridiculed while in the legislature trying to do what I think would be a value to this society? I theorized, I hypothesized, I extrapolated. And here's what I came up with. In 2016, January, at the beginning of the legislative session, this is 2022. Six years ago, this is what I offered as legislation. Bill would require background checks for gear. I could see, not that I can tell the future, I can learn from the past. I can detect what looks like a trend to me. And if it's gonna be harmful to the extent that I could as a member of the legislature, I would try to get legislation that would shield society at large from the harm that I saw from my hypothesizing and theorizing would occur. This guy was wearing the bulletproof gear. Security guard shot and hit him, but it hit the gear that turned the shots aside. The killer was not hurt. The security guard was killed. Here's the headline. Bill would require background checks for gear. Chambers introduces measure that would cover armor, scopes, et cetera. This was appeared in the Lincoln Journal Star. If Nebraskans must submit to background checks to purchase firearms, should they also submit to checks to purchase tactical gear and military type equipment? Omaha Senator Ernie Chambers thinks so, although maybe not for the reason most people might presume. He's not thinking about terrorists from foreign countries. He's considering the possible harm from people born and raised in America. The bill would cover gear typically used by police, special weapons and tactics teams, military grade helmets, body armor, night vision eyewear or scopes and high capacity ammunition magazines. Six years ago, and I was mocked, criticized, condemned, and people said I didn't know what I was talking about. Continuing, purchasers would have to be 21 and pass the same federal background check as if purchasing a firearm. If a person would not be allowed to purchase or possess a firearm under the federal law, he or she would not be allowed to purchase that gear. And why would the person need that gear? To hunt deer, 
to hunt geese and pheasants, to catch fish. Chambers, who is serving his 42nd year in the Nebraska legislature, most of that time as the only black senator, said he is looking at conduct and not who is committing it. Quote, the driving principle is not that white Americans think of, not what white Americans think of when they hear the term terrorism, he said. They're thinking about someone from another country, unquote. But no so-called terrorist has created as much havoc, taken as many lives of men, women, and little children as white Christian Americans, he said. But none of those acts were labeled terrorism, nor were the per perpetrators called terrorists. What's happening in Oregon with people occupying headquarters of a federal wildlife refuge is subversive, a direct armed challenge against the authority of the United States, Chambers said, quote, but since white men are doing it, it's treated in almost a whole hum fashion. This is what white men do, unquote. It's an example, Chambers said, of what so-called law-abiding Americans do when they get these guns and they don't like what's going on. If Muslims did the same thing, he said, authorities would kill as many as they could and then brand every other Muslim as a threat and round them up. If they were black people, they'd be shot down right now, he said, and black people without weapons who are charged with a minor traffic infraction are shot down in broad daylight like wild animals. Continuing, when black people have demonstrated across the country against police violence, unarmed and not threatening direct violence, there were military vehicles and military weaponry standing by, Chambers said, even though nobody was taking armed control of anything. People can be arrested if they articulate a desire or intent to go to Syria or Iraq or Iran, he said. If the mere expression of an opinion is sufficient to be arrested and charged with a serious offense that can carry years in prison, then it's not unreasonable to bring a bill to deal with the kind of equipment and garb that would bespeak illegal violence, Chambers said, and they laughed at it. They laughed at me. And this white guy wore this very kind of gear and he could have been stopped by the security guard who shot, but the bullets were turned away, turned aside. Police said 11 of the victims were black and two white. The supermarket is in a predominantly black neighborhood a few miles north of downtown Buffalo. This is the worst nightmare that any community can face and we are hurting and we are seething right now, Buffalo mayor said. And this white guy had made it clear that had he survived and gotten away from that scene, he was going to go down this particular street and kill as many black people as he could. I'm going to read more of this later, but something else happened. This is from Wednesday's paper. Gunman kills at least 21 at Texas school. Now we're dealing closer to home. An 18-year-old gunman opened fire Tuesday at a Texas elementary school, killing at least 19 children as he went from classroom to classroom, officials said, in the latest gruesome moment for a country scarred by a stream of massacres. The attacker was killed by law enforcement. The death toll also included two adults, authorities said. Governor Greg Abbott said one of the two was a teacher. The assault at Robb Elementary Schools in heavily Latino town of Uvalde was the deadliest shooting at a US grade school since a gunman killed 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut, almost a decade ago. I'm gonna continue this, the next program. My time is running out, but I wanna read an article, part of it. This is dated October 11, 2007. This is 2022. Seven from 22 is how much? 15, 15 years ago, Chambers wants gun crackdown. The lawmaker says violence won't be curbed until weapons are. 
State Senator Ernie Chambers of Omaha said Wednesday that his community's problems with violence won't be resolved until authorities begin tracking down and weeding out those who are supplying guns to young people. Quote, where are our kids getting these guns, Chambers asked. These guns are commonly in the hands of all these young people, but nothing is being done to stop them from getting the guns. He said the violence is too easily blamed on a breakdown in parenting among Black Omahans. Quote, if this were happening in the white community, action would be taken to stop these guns from coming in, he said. They didn't blame down, they didn't blame a breakdown in par parenting when methamphetamine was on the rise. They didn't say white people must get out and stop it. They didn't say it was a breakdown in the community. They said the legislature's got to do something about this. And I know because they came down there. Chambers was responding to Monday's comments by Mayor Mike Fahey, who said Friday's shooting death of a six-year-old girl would have happened no matter how many police officers were on the street. Quote, a lot of this is tied to parenting, the lack of parenting, the lack of mentoring, Fahey said, the white man speaking. Chambers said he intended to keep pressuring the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the FBI, as well as local law enforcement agencies to investigate gun dealing in Omaha. In the first seven months of this year, authorities seized 471 guns, the largest share, 216, coming from Northeast Omaha. Of those, 121 guns were seized in July alone. Now, this is one of those situations where when it involved black people, it's a breakdown in parenting. What about when these white murderers, the mass shooters go up, go out? Is that a breakdown in parenting? Is it a breakdown in society? The NRA say it's the one who did the shooting that is responsible. People kill people, not guns. But see, without guns, they wouldn't kill as many as quickly or as often, and some of them are afraid of their shadow. But whenever it's white people, different strokes for different folks. Am I bitter? Bitter is a mild term for it. But carrying that mental burden of knowing how racist this society is, how this country denies its own history, mislabels so that they can do things to people they don't like, and justify it even when those people have not harmed them in any way. Despite that, for 46 years, I stayed down there among white people who could be called my enemies, not because of what I did to them, but because of what they would like to do to the people and against the people who I cared about. And those people were not all black, they were people. They were what I described as the downtrodden, the ones on the underside of society's carpet, the ones who are the unpeople, the expendables, black people, obviously, Latinos next in line, Native Americans, then poor white people, oh, and women in general. The things I did would benefit everybody, but I used our experience as black people to let them know that I understand what I'm talking about. If you are considering becoming a writer and author, you're told to write about what you know about. I know about violence, not because I commit it, not because I've always witnessed it, but I've witnessed enough of it. I know enough people who were victimized by it. And these include not people of just of my complexion, but addressing white people, your complexion, your eye color, your hair color, they were human beings to me. I am so opposed to one human being killing, killing, killing another. I did all I could for all those 46 years to abolish the death penalty. I didn't think Adolf Eichmann, who presided over the murder of 6 million Jews, Russians, so-called gypsies, I didn't think he should have been killed. I didn't. That didn't correct anything. 
And for Eichmann, it made it easy for him. He was out of the picture. It made some people feel good because now he's dead. But then some had regrets. They said, it's too bad he died so easily. He ought to have had to languish in a prison. I don't even think people ought to be tortured in prison. I don't think they ought to be kept in solitary confinement. I don't think anybody's basic, fundamental, intrinsic human dignity ought to be trampled upon. And when those people who consider themselves superior are willing to degrade, demean, and destroy that essential human dignity that every person has, even though the person who has it may not live up to it or follow its dictates, that person committing the atrocity is undermining his, her, his or her own human dignity. And in the process, human dignity will become two words that have no meaning whatsoever. They elicit laughter. What is human dignity? There is no such thing. So for somebody like me, who on occasion deals in absolutes, even the one considered the lowest has to have that spark of humanity, that which makes that being a human being has to be respected. It cannot be demeaned, debased, degraded. Killing it in somebody else takes a little bit of ours away from us because if we lived in accord with and acted based upon the concept of human dignity that we want to cloak ourselves in, then that cloak will prevent us from destroying somebody else's human dignity. But that's me. That is what I operated on as a principle. And because of that, I was able to maintain my sanity for all of those years. And as time goes on, I'm going to bring concrete evidence of the kind of legislation I brought, the cases that I won in court representing myself that people are unaware of that changed the law without me having to do it legislatively. I will bring that out. I will show how having studied the white people's constitution and taken it seriously, even though we didn't enjoy the privileges, the immunities, the protections that a so-called citizen should have, and you're a so-called citizen if you're born or naturalized in this country, we were born here, we don't have those privileges, rights and immunities, so obviously we're not deemed citizens. Even though I was being denied these things and deprived of them, people of my complexion, I wanted those privileges and immunities to apply to everything born of a man and a woman, even white criminals, even white haters. I was not one who said that they should catch the Ku Klux Klan, which hanged a black man and burned him while he was still alive, should have the th same thing done to them. There was a movie called Judge Roy Bean and Paul Newman played Judge Roy Bean. He's a pretty good actor. And he played this judge who was over a small Texas town and he'd have people hang for any little thing, take him out, string him up. And he was the law. So this guy called Bad Bob came to town and Bad Bob was so, had such an itchy trigger finger, his hands were twitching all the time, all the time. So Bad Bob was sitting around this campfire with these people in this farmyard. And bad Bob was so bad, he took a raw onion, chewed that onion up, savored it and swallowed it. Then like that creature in this song, I bought my new house the other day, moving was hot and I got, but I got squared away. Then bell started ringing, change rattled loud. I knew I'd moved in a haunted house. Then he talked about all the things that happened. He said, from outer space, there sat a man on the hot stove with the pots in the pan. That's hot, I cried, you better look out. He drank the hot coffee right from the spout. Well, Bob, bad Bob, picked up 
that gurgling coffee in that pot after consuming that onion washes down with that hot water that hot coffee because he had come to town looking for judge roy bean well judge roy bean was up in the hayloft waiting in ambush hidden not like the courageous guy they show john wayne to be where two guys walk down the street at each other facing each other or jim jim arnest playing matt Dillon and Gunsmoke and the famous gunfight and the guy that Matt Dillon was gonna shoot down, shot first. Then Matt Dillon shot him and killed him. Well, while bad Bob is sitting around the campfire talking about what he's gonna to do to Judge Roy Bean, Judge Roy Bean got a rifle, drew a bead on Judge on a bad Bob and it was a semi-comedy and he fired. And when the bullet hit him, then it made a hole and the camera let you see through that hole. And naturally, bad Bob toppled into the fire. And all these people were sitting around impressed by him. They looked up and they saw that it was Judge Roy Bean. And he came out the garage, the barn, and they said, Jerry, Jerry, you didn't even, you didn't give him a fair chance. And Judge Roy Bean said, if he wanted a fair chance, he shouldn't have come to my town. In other words, know where you're going know what you're going to face, know the kind of people that you're dealing with, and not everybody's going to face you down, and you have a fair chance, and whoever draws the gun the quickest is going to win. I believe that my time is up, so as chirped the canary upon being aware that the cage door was ajar, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.